Hi, this is Jeff Walton with the Institute on Religion and Democracy in Washington, D.C. I'm joined today with Luke Moon from the Philos Project. Uh, Luke's a former colleague of mine at IRD, and uh, he's been involved in an organization that does positive Christian engagement with Israel. Um, thanks so much for uh, joining me today, Luke. Thanks, Jeff. Good to see you. Um, could you go and just share with the viewers of this uh, video who are not familiar with Philos, um, sort of what's your, your goal as an organization and how did Philos come about? Yeah, Philos Project was started in uh, 2014. Uh, we we're starting really to uh, promote positive Christian engagement in the Middle East and has since modified that a little bit to, to actually call it pro promoting positive Christian engagement in the Near East. Uh, the Middle East become, you know, basically for, for a lot of descriptors includes, you know, it could include Afghanistan, right? Not really, but, you know, basically Middle East is considered like the Muslim world and that that's a huge area. So our focus has, it has been and is largely uh, Israel and the surrounding nations, you know, Lebanon, um, uh, Iraq, uh, Jordan, Egypt, you know, places where they actually the kind of the, um, the birthplace of Christianity and its early spread. So it, that's been, that, that is our focus. And we're, we're interested in promoting pluralism, rule of law, seeing people thrive and, and flourish in, in that region that, that there's a lot of people who want it to be a, you know, mono-religious, mono-ethnic, mono-linguistic region. And we just think that that's, problematic. We want to see a multi-ethnic, multi-racial, multi-religious Middle East. And so we, we uh, work to promote that uh, all over the place. Thank you. Um, one of the reasons that I've reached out to you is uh, IRD focuses on public policy pronouncements from uh, mainline church uh, denominations, their agencies, boards, prominent pastors, things like that. And um, this week, uh, May 15th, um, some of these churches, uh, including the Presbyterian Mission Agency of the PCUSA, um, the General Ministries of um, the United Church of Christ and Disciples of Christ, and a few other mainline Protestant bodies, are commemorating Nakba, Nakba Day. And um, this is something that some viewers won't be familiar with. Um, it is a day marking uh, the... Uh, the founding of the Israeli state, and it is held by uh, Palestinians. I believe it was established in 1998 by Yasser Arafat to mark the quote unquote calamity of the founding of Israel. Um, can you tell us a little about Nakba uh, commemorations? Um, sort of what, what is, who's advancing them? What, what is sort of the goal behind it? And um, some of the, the narratives that go along with Nakba commemorations. Yeah, I, I mean, I think, you know, aptly described, you know, as, as you described it, is it, it means catastrophe in Arab, Arabic. And it's really recognizing uh, for, for them, the establishment of the, or I would say the, the reestablishment of Israel or establishment of modern state of Israel um, is seen by, by them and many in the Arab world as being a catastrophe. It was, it was, a, it was like a terrible thing. And uh, in spite of the fact that, you know, the, the surrounding nations of Israel, the day that Israel, you know, declared independence, started attacking it, right? And, and they lost th those battles and established what, what became known as the Green Line and, the, and, you know, created the West Bank and Gaza, all that got created in that, in that day. The commemorations largely uh, involve you know, kind of public pronouncements, and there's a lot of hand-wringing and a lot of, you know, declarations against Israel and the Zionist state and, you know, the usual kind of, um, kind of blustering stuff that you get out of, you know, leaders in, in, uh, in, in, you know, particularly with like Hamas and some of the terrorist organizations, they will be, you know, very strong in their pronouncements, and then others in the region will be a bit more like measured and thoughtful. But, uh, you know, it is problematic that you have a day of, of kind of declaring, you know, how terrible it was that Israel was established. Um, and, 
and you know, it will be my, my sense is that this year will be a bit more measured because of, uh, because of the impact of coronavirus in the Palestinian territories is, is limiting, um, you know, the size and, and scope of some of the, what would typically, a, a be some, some major rallies. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I understand. Um, some of the uh, organizations um, have been putting out articles about this. Um, the uh, Presbyterian Church had an article up earlier today uh, about um, Nakba commemoration, and they tend to use the language, and this is a quote, of uh, oppressor and oppressed. And what they mean by this narrative is that usually they interpret uh, Jewish peoples or it is state of Israel to be in the oppressor role and uh, Arab, Palestinian, or Muslim peoples um, to be in the oppressed role. Um, you've spent a lot of time in the Middle East and you've been in conversation with a lot of different people over the years. Um, what are some of the things that you've encountered, stories you've heard that that complicate that narrative? Yeah, I mean, it, the 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 problem with the narrative is that both sides see themselves within that framework, you know, whether it's the oppressed oppressor framework or the victim villain framework, it's the, the reality is both sides see themselves in, in that, in that framework. And, you know, the only way that you overcome the victim villain structure or the oppressor oppressed is by making sure that the, that the, the villain is punished and the victim is rescued, right? But if both if both sides see themselves within that frame, like you're never going to get anywhere. And that's 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 what you see a lot on the ground, um, because it 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 really depends on your perspective, right? For for the uh, for the Palestinians living in the West Bank or or, or Gaza, the uh, Israel is seen as as the you know the the power structure the power imbalance is in there is in the direction of you know Israel has all the all the guns and they have the airplanes and they have the tanks and they have all the stuff right but if you're from if you're if you're from the looking at it from the Israeli perspective they're surrounded by 350 million Muslims many of which have been consistently calling for uh, their destruction and for them to be pushed into the sea, right? Like, so, you know, for, for the average Israeli, the power imbalance, the power structure is, is Israel versus the rest of the Arab world, the 350 million Arabs in the Arab world, right? Like, so it, it does depend on how you look at it. And, and that's what you find when you actually have conversations with people. Right, like it's it's very it's very easy and actually you know fits on a bumper sticker to talk about the oppressed and oppressor. But what you find is that it's it's much more complicated. I find that you know when you have a it, when you have a a group of Palestinian Christians talk to you about you know Israel and the conflict, they'll they'll tell you about you know how wonderful the relationship is with their muslim neighbors and you know everybody in palestine is united uh against the zionist uh enterprise you know that kind of stuff but then if you get people alone you find that the that you know they the the christians are often mistreated by their palestinian neighbors and that like the the picture isn't as 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 nice and clean as many uh particularly uh in these churches in the U.S. would like it to be. Some of the, the officials in some of these churches have uh, advanced or responded at least more favorably towards a strategy of boycott, divestment, and sanctions known as the BDS movement. Um, and you and I have both had conversations with folks at um, these uh, conventions, including um, United Methodist General Conference, uh, the, the Episcopal Church's General Convention, and uh, in your case, um, Presbyterian General Assembly. Um, why is it that BDS has kind of found a foothold in some of those church circles? And uh, is that something that you see as expanding or has the, um, 
sort of the low hanging fruit for the BDS movement been picked and they've now gone on in search of, of other um, uh, more, more for, fertile ground for support for that particular movement. Yeah, the, the boycott divestment sanction movement, BDS movement uh, really de did get um, a strong foothold in particularly the, the old line uh, denominations in the United States. Uh, the problem is like, well, actually, let me give you an example. The, the, the uh, United Church of Christ, I think, was the first uh, church denomination to actively affirm BDS, to say they were, you know, they were going to divest from, you know, from businesses, you know, do, that had anything to do with the state of Israel. Well, it turns out they actually didn't. They actually didn't divest. So, yeah, I, I actually find that uh, even when these churches put out statements saying that they are going to divest or that they have divested, it's, it's, it's actually tends to not be true. Um, in reality, the investment doesn't necessarily happen unless that the, the securities are actually sold and they're no longer right. being held by the, the pension board or whoever else. Exactly. And they actually, and, and, and the reality is actually much more complicated, much has to do with the, you know, fiduciary responsibility of the investment arms of these denominations, which are usually independent uh, nonprofits that have board members representing the church on them. But when they're independent uh, entities, they're actually obligated to the, uh, you know, to the, the, the legal investment structures of the state in which they find themselves, many of which have, uh, you know, if, if, you know, for example, stock in Boeing is going up and, you know, you're a, you're a pastor of a UCC church and you're like, well, why isn't my, you know, why aren't, why aren't, you know, my investors investing in Boeing, everybody else is and Boeing's doing great, you know, and, and mm -hmm. so the, the, they can actually sue that entity for, for failing their fiduciary responsibility to make money, right? Like, so mm -hmm. the whole BDS um, in reality is, is, is non-existent in, but in, you know, in strong statements from the churches that it's mm -hmm. all over the place, right? Like, so, you know, the Methodist church has not uh, di done em embraced uh, BDS officially but some of the church denominate or, 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 you know, districts or some of the, the, you know, the bodies within the Methodist church have, mm -hmm. you know, affirmed uh, and promote BDS as a, as a policy of the church, even though the church itself has not divested mm -hmm. or chosen that path. And, mm -hmm. you know, so, similarly with the Presbyterians and the, the Lutherans, um, I think it's, it, it's much more of a, um, you know, like a, a PR win, if you will, mm -hmm. than an actual, you know, does it affect anything on the ground? It, it does not. Mm -hmm. And real, the reality is, Jeff, that that I would say over the last, I don't know, six months, year or so, the the whole conversation about. Uh, BDS has pretty much evaporated from just about any group that I'm engaging mm. and has has largely shifted um, you know to uh, to the conversation about anti-semitism you know mm -hmm. it really kind of tipped off with the with the massacre in Pittsburgh and then the shootings mm -hmm. in uh, San Diego and then you know in the kosher deli in Jersey city and the stuff at the end of the, you know, the anti-Semitism on the streets of New York and Brooklyn at the end of last year, all of that, I think kind of shifted the conversation away from this kind of like boycott divestment sanction structure mm -hmm. to one that's a bit more, it's a bit more local. It's a, it's, it, and it's, it's one that I think is, is actually, um, is is more helpful and more more interesting and and you know the even the founder recently you know i i, I think the bds movement is largely you know died at this point as a as a you know force to be reckoned with because you know the founder of the of the bds movement recently said that if if israel 
uh, in, you know, creates the vaccine for coronavirus, uh, then, you know, we'll, we're under no obligation to boycott Israel. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. So, okay. So what did it mean? It means that this is just, uh, you know, that you're actually not on principle boycotting the investment sanction. It's, it's, mm -hmm. it's a convenient uh, stick uh, to, mm -hmm. to beat Israel and the Jewish people with. Mm -hmm. uh, you've uh, spent a lot of time as an organization with um, younger people. Um, what are some of the things that you're seeing um, on campus environments that are taking place? Um, is there a, uh, a significant pushback to uh, anti-Semitic anti uh, things? Uh, what what is sort of the the lay of the land uh, in higher education? Yeah, I think it, you know in the in schools the, the challenge is um, you know there's there's a bit of a like a kind of a whack a mole kind of perception here because you'll have a you'll have you'll have a a real problem uh, with kind of the BDS anti-Semitic kind of anti-Israel rhetoric will show itself in a you know, in a, in a UC school like UC Davis, you know, for, for a couple of years. And then whoever was leading that movement ends up, uh, you know, ends up, you know, graduating. And the, the next leader is not as good. It's not as strong. Right. And so what, what ends up happening is you have it, we, what we've, we've learned really is it comes down to uh, leadership, right? If the leadership, is on the on the anti-Israel side in particular schools is if they're if they're good leaders then you'll have an issue if they're not it'll be just kind of you know just the kind of run-of-the-mill kind of um anti-Israel anti-Jewish anti anti-semitic anti kind of rhetoric but it won't be it, it won't mm -hmm. have a you know major impact so Mm -hmm. Yeah, I understand. Um, evangelicals, as we've talked about before, have made up an increasing share of the uh, U.S. religious landscape. Um, what is uh, the situation with them? I know historically evangelicals have been uh, known as uh, being very pro-Israel. Uh, certain Christian Zionist influences uh, were at play there. Um, but uh, I've also seen different voices come out of the evangelical community on this. Uh, what's your perception of what's going on there at the moment? I think within within the evangelical church, I think, I mean, the evangelicalism, you know, crosses a lot of different denominations. And so you'll have, within denominations, you'll have, have you know, I, I'll, g I'll give an example. The Southern Baptists um, are largely kind of divided between the, you know, the, the more Arminian side of the Southern Baptist and the versus the more cons, um, reformed side of the Southern Baptist, right? And the more reformed side theologically is is not necessarily supportive of Israel, while they're while they support Israel uh, politically or institutionally or historically, uh, whereas as the Arminians tend to have a much stronger uh, like pro-Israel uh, bent theologically right and so mm -hmm. it comes across in a lot of different denominations um you have it but it's it's largely i would say kind of focused on uh more within the white evangelical um group if you will uh mm -hmm. but there is a strong pro-israel movement within uh within Latin America, particularly within mm -hmm. the Pentecostal and charismatic circles. Um, mm -hmm. And then, uh, you know, rising also within, within the global South um, with, with Africa as well. And so uh, even, you know, if the, if the white evangelical movement in, in the U S uh, declines, I, I think the global South uh, is going to pick up the slack. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, that's really interesting. You mentioned uh, the Latin American context because uh, I do remember reading earlier this year how the changes in government in um, both uh, Brazil and especially Bolivia, um, which often took place with a constituency of at least partial evangelical support, uh, resulted in a significant policy change towards um, diplomatic relations with Israel 
uh, and those those countries' uh, new leaders. Yeah, no, you see that like uh, Bolivia and and Brazil both had uh, significant changes in that direction. Um, Guatemala, uh, Honduras also have uh, you know it's uh, Guatemala moved its embassy uh, to Jerusalem. Honduras mm -hmm. is likely to do something similar. Bolivia and Brazil similar. It, it's there is a there is that um, I think one of the one of the things that you consistently see is if is the if people are reading their Bibles consistently, if people there's a there's a strong connection between uh, biblical literacy, biblical mm -hmm. you know recognition or or affirmation of uh, the authority of Scripture, the inerrancy of Scripture. You tend to find within those contexts that people are uh, tend to be pro-Israel, right? Because they read in their Bibles, Jerusalem and, and the Jews and Judea and Samaria, like the, 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 all this stuff uh, is, is there in Israel today, right? So it's, mm -hmm. they, they, see, they, they have a, it creates a, like a, a natural connection. Uh, and it's in, in a lot of these places, it's, it's kind of un, unencumbered by, by by politics right it's, it's just a very um it's a very kind of pure <laughs> support for mm -hmm. israel and the jewish people well thanks so much for uh taking some time out of your morning to uh share with me about these things um it'll be really interesting to see um at upcoming church conventions how um some of these changes in conversation that you've mentioned especially around uh, uh fighting a um an anti-Semitism that seems much closer to home than we might have previously presumed have uh, begun to shape things. Yeah. Uh, but um, again, uh, oh, go ahead. It'll be uh, interesting also to see, uh, you know, if they, at these particular conventions that were supposed to take place this year, it, you know, now that they're having to move online uh, or to a Zoom sessions, whether they're going to even be bothered with, um, you know, some of those, what would previously have been, a, you know, they would have made, ish, you know, the, the Israel-Palestine conversation a very kind of key point, whether it will actually even, you know, come up. And my sense is yeah. it will not. Um, yeah, yeah, the the Presbyterian General Assembly, which is scheduled for late June in Baltimore, but will be held virtually, uh, they're already talking about stripping down the agenda to be basically just what must be done in order to keep the wheels turning at these denominational agencies, but not necessarily the policy pronouncements or um, sort of the, the bureaucratic resolutions that uh, we traditionally see that are more politicized. Yep. Well, uh, yes, yeah. <laughs> yeah, uh, let me uh, give an opportunity. Um, if folks are interested, what is the uh, website for Philos that folks should visit? The philosproject.org, uh, and we have, there's a lot on there, and we, we actually just launched this last week a, um, a thing we call Jaffa Gate, which is a, basically an, a, like a resource uh, site for uh, news and resources about uh, what's happening in the, in, in the Near East, and also provides a way people can engage and be involved. Great. Well, thanks so much, Luke. I uh, really appreciate it, and uh, hope you have a good day. Thank you, Jeff.